Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on the Balanced Scorecard. What does it mean and how to implement it? Ian Moody is sitting right by my side and I'll hand over to him just after I run through some housekeeping rules. The slides that you see today and the recording of the entire webinar will be available on our SlideShare page as well as on our YouTube channel and we will email you the links to these in due course. When the webinar finishes, you'll see a survey pop up which helps us to know how we've done and, and what you've thought about the webinar. And I just ask that you'll give it a few minutes of your time to complete so that we get your feedback. As you're listening to Ian talking, you might have some questions and you can type these in for us in the bottom right hand of the control panel. You'll see a question box there and this is your way to communicate with us. Um, and Ian will allocate time at the end to answer these. So with all of that out of the way, I'll now hand you over to Ian. Thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, I'm Ian Moody. Okay, um, balance scorecard. I, I, I'll let you read a bit about the presenter in due course, and I'm certainly not going to bore you with that. Um, why are we doing this? Because we wanted to introduce the concepts of the balanced scorecards and how they work in organizations. And we want to try and ensure that everybody has some sort of understanding of what it does and maybe how that fits into the Malcolm Borgwich model for performance excellence, uh, which is a very fam famous performance management tool. Um, okay, uh, companies keep talking about performance. Um, performance measurement, performance, performance improving systems of performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It really gets very much into the area of goals and objectives and objective management and KPIs and SLAs and all these various tools. They're so much a major part of what we talk about in business today. Everybody is trying to do better and better than everybody else. Everybody's trying to outperform everybody else. So the balance scorecard is one of the tools that's become extremely popular over the last few years because it's the only truly integrated performance management tool or management stroke measurement tool. Um, so what actually is it? Why do we get it? Um, because organizations have become much more strategically focused. Um, lots of issues being, being um, initiatives being issued um, as a part of the British government, which is the Budget and Strategic Planning Unit, and they put out for governmental spend and governmental um, management that we should be much more strategic in the way we plan and the way that we manage and control our budgets. Um, so that is an element there. Uh, people at all levels um, have started to become more tactical in their performance measurements. Um, they use certain types of numbered maps and numbered land structures, etc. Percentage of vendor contracts in place. There's, in fact, there's 101 different methods that they use to measure tactical performance. Um, so we're moving from operational to tactical and in reality to strategic as we go, the three levels of business organizations. Um, all right, there's a more greater need to keep balancing or creating a balanced approach um, when we look at performance. Um, traditionally, we tended to look at performance measurements in isolation. So a strategic function would have its set of performance measurements, a tactical function would have its set of performance measurements, and indeed, therefore, the operational function would have those. And it never works because nobody understands what they're trying to do. They don't understand what is coming from the top, and the top don't understand what's going on at the bottom. And then everybody turns around and says, we're not meeting our goals. We are failing. We're creating strategic drift. So we're starting to say, we need to look at creating this balance across all, the, all of the different levels of organizations. And then general research has, has frightened people because we then discover that, that only about 5% of people that work within the organization really understand the company strategy. They don't know what it means. They, they might know that there's a vision statement. They may not. They can rarely explain its meaning, let alone tell you what it is. They might know that there's a set of corporate objectives written to the mission statement. 
but they don't know what they are and they don't know what it means and they don't know how to use it and they don't know how it applies to them. So we have some major problems going on here. Um, and then we look at even further and then we discover that when you look at executive senior managers, like boards of directors, 80%, 80, 90%, something like 86 was the survey, uh, of these guys spend less than one hour in average months discussing strategies. But they are there to create strategic direction for their organization. That is their job. They are there to make big strategic decisions, to keep the direction flowing into the future, to create sustainable businesses, to gain and maintain competitive advantages. That's what they're there for. That's what they're paid for. But they don't do it. They get wrapped up with other things. Sometimes, who knows what they might be doing. But that is a reality. Um, okay. Um, when we go into that in a little more detail, the major driver is the organized information resource and planning systems. We, we look at information resource and we look at the way in how we are adding more and more informational systems into our business to help us control it. Everything management information systems, specific types of software, specific like uses, to integrated database systems like SAP, all these things, they're all coming in. And they should all be linked into planning functions, but frequently they're not. So we need to start thinking about exactly what we should be doing. We should be using a totally integrated, across the whole business, enterprise-wide system that evaluates our success as a business, right? We should be able to divide and do readouts and data turnarounds and global partnerships and everything that we need, we should be able to see. Um, we must integrate all of the various agency components, such as regions and global offices and everything. Agency by which I mean any strategic internal agency function of the business. Uh, that is to say, a shared service component, as it's commonly referred to, often referred to as an agency inside the business. Uh, that doesn't mean a, um, an estate agent or a car agent. Um, okay, and, and we then design this around the whole balance scored card framework. So the balance scored card is a methodology that's used to give a strategic view to performance of the business and to balance the strategic view with all of our tactical areas of performance and already balance that again even further down the system through the operational levels to make sure that everything is integrating. Back in 1992, um, Bob Kaplan and David Norton created what is commonly referred to therefore as the balance scorecard. Um, it's a framework for ensuring that all agencies of the organization execute their strategies properly. If you look in the US today, 70% of Fortune top 1000 companies utilize, uh, fully utilize the balance scorecard to help manage their performance. Some do it very well, some do it not so well. 70% of the top companies in the US are now using the balance scorecard. That is, of course, the world's largest single economy. Um, that doesn't mean to say that everybody else does it or everybody else doesn't do it, but it's just a number that we find easy to come up with. Um, balance scorecards are used as a road mapping for creating strategic management systems. They're used to help us drive organizational performance for the entire business, not just for one element of the business. Um, what, it, what it does is it works with a series of basic principles. It quantifies strategy in measurable terms. Um, much of strategy is very general. 
we need to have ways of measuring it. Um, in this case, strategy is summarized on a strategic map with four different views of performance, which are known as perspectives. Um, that's only what they are called, perspectives. They're views of performance, ways of looking at performance. Um, they're designed to capture cause and effect relationships between strategic objectives and each of the four performance measurements, that is to say, the perspectives on that strategic map. Um, it does this by looking at a series of critical components. It sets down the measurement system. It then creates a set of targets. And then beyond that, it says, how are we going to achieve these targets? What initiatives are we going to use? Okay, so it sets down simple terms. It sets down the goal, sets the objectives. How do we measure the objectives? What are the targets against that? And then what are the initiatives we're going to do to meet this? A target measurement measurement system. It could be a KPI. It's a measurement system. That's what it is. Everything must be linked. So goals must be linked to objectives. Objectives must be linked to measurements. Measurements must be linked to targets. It is a vital thing that we need to ensure we get. So we get what is known as goal congruence throughout the organization. Goals to objectives, objectives to measurements, measurements to target. And everybody knows the expression smart, um, specific, measurable, agreeable, or achievable, depending on who you talk to, relevant or realistic, or, and time bound. Um, <coughs> measurement, measurement. Measurement, there it is, measurement. KPI is a measurement tool for measuring objectives. But those objectives must be related to the goals. So it's not complex. Um, how do we look at this? Well, what do we have? We have a, a series of strategic goals, and then we set a series of strategic objectives. The strategy must understand that there's a series of cause and effect relationships. It must provide a simple line of sight throughout all of the activities, right? It's designed to working on things that get things right. Core to all business success is understanding stakeholders. Failure to understand stakeholders is commercial suicide. You need to know what it is that the various stakeholder groups expect from your business. Um, stakeholders, many definitions of what we mean by a stakeholder. Lots of definitions. But individuals or groups of individuals who depend upon the business. And in turn, the business comes to depend upon. That's by, uh, sorry, um, Scholes and Whittington in their book, Exploring Strategy. Um, there are different groups of stakeholders, internal stakeholders, connected stakeholders, external stakeholders. They're all different types. They all have different levels of power and influence on their business. And the problem is, it varies depending on what you're doing. And the power of different stakeholders changes all of the time. One of the most powerful groups of stakeholders are external from the organization. That is to say, they have no contractual obligation to the organization. And the organization has no contractual <coughs> obligation to them. Example? The media, the press. The media can literally destroy businesses. They want to report on what you are doing wrong. Uh, you could argue that media in your own country, in your home nation, may not want to do that. Or they may have a degree of restriction because of, say, a lack of free press. But unfortunately, you work in a global marketplace. And just because they may not report, say, here in the UAE, doesn't mean they won't report somewhere else around the world. 
and then all you have to do is flick a television and look at 24-hour news channels reporting every hour and every day on what you are doing. You better understand your stakeholders, right? And you better understand what it is they need and how you're going to look at them. Another key area of performance you're going to need to measure is the internal processes. What is it that you have to do to keep your customers satisfied? What processes are you good at? What processes are you bad at? And what ones do you need? That's important. But what ones do you need to satisfy your stakeholders? Number three, learning and growth. A lot of people misconfuse this, confuse this, and they think we're talking about training. Well, we might be, but that's only one very small element. Learning and growth. The learning organization. The organization that grows and develops through time. It grows and develops, that is, the organization that becomes more effective at what it does by learning from past mistakes. Learning from benchmarking. Um, so learning and development, what do we have to do to execute our processes? How do we know that we're getting it right? Are we learning? Are we improving? Are we developing? And then, of course, agency investments in general. What does each section need to do? What level of infrastructure do we need? What level of development do we need within the organization? <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. I've got a bit of a throat. Um, okay. So... Um, the importance of alignment. So I've already said, what do we get? Corporate level of business, strategic level if you want, business level, tactical level, operational level. The strategy must align through all levels. And the strategy, which effectively is the goals, has to be translated into objectives, which must be aligned through all the levels of the business. And the measurement systems, for example, KPIs, must be set directly in line with the objectives to help you to find out, are you achieving them? And they, in turn, must be aligned at all three levels of the business. The problem comes is when there is no relationship between the measurement and the objectives and the objectives and the strategy. They're taken in isolation. It is also a problem when each one of the levels of business activity are not aligned. They're not pushing in one direction. They're all doing their own thing. It is a serious recipe for business disaster. And it's one of the biggest reasons why companies get themselves into trouble. So the way alignment might look, you set the goal, you check if there's a gap, if there's any form of gap between what you're doing and what you should be doing. And then you set the initiative, this method by which you will close that gap. And it is like a big jigsaw puzzle like a massive jigsaw puzzle of things that must come together to form the complete picture. And it, and it can involve many different things. Just for example here, what have we got? We have to know what our financial management systems are, what our levels of innovation are, how to prove cause, effect, knowledge bases, what the business processes are, how they're used to report or improve um, in the environment, assess reports, what resource management we've got, what investment management we've got, what investments are available to be allocated to critical areas, for example, how these things link into the idea of sustainability. And sustainability here does not mean the green environment, the ecological sustainability. It means business sustainability. It means the business being able to go forward. How the relationship management is, what kind of relationship management have? What is our internal relationship management like? How well do we relate to our internal stakeholders? 
What is our external relationship management like in general to stakeholder groups, but quite specifically to our customers and our suppliers? If we don't have good relationship with our customers, we have no business because nobody will want to buy from us. Nobody will want to receive our services. The balance scorecard works perfectly well within the public sector, just the same, because we have got customers, people that come to take our services, people that want to receive our, the medical services or schools or whatever it is. If they don't want us, we have no customer. We have no reason to exist. And without input, we have no output. So we need our supply chain. We need our suppliers. And we need everyone to align. And we need information and money to flow in both directions. It's absolutely key. Don't forget, at the end of the day, the only reason we have money in our organization is because the customers put it there. If the customers don't spend with us, there is no money. So in order to be successful, we need to try to balance a set of limited and vital measurements. We don't want to overcomplicate this. We don't make it too difficult. We need to ensure that we can produce timely, useful reports at a reasonable cost that everybody understands that add benefit. We need to be able to display and make everybody find the information that we have. We need to better share it. We need to better understand it. And we need to know what every agency of the business is doing and how they're using it. We need to support the organization's values and the relationships the organization has with its customers, its suppliers, and the other stakeholder groups. So. If we don't do that, we're going to be in trouble. So before we can map out any form of strategy, you need to set quantifiable strategic objectives. They mustn't be too vague. So for example, it is vague if you say improve customer service. It's the kind of comment you see. Um, you even see people who write mission statements to say, our mission is to be the finest at customer service. It means nothing. You need to be more precise. So reduce average customer wait time is by 30% by the end of this year is a precise quantifiable objective. You can actually use it quite easily because it's specific, 30%. It is time-bound, end of the year. It is measurable, because I can measure 30% by the end of this year. You need to make all objectives have a direct relationship to your goals, and your goals have a direct relationship to your mission and the value that's laid down at the strategic level of the business. Everything has to be interlinked. So very, very important, before we can even start work, we need to make sure that we've got quantifiable objectives. They mustn't be too vague. They must be precise. All right. Um, writing good objectives is, is difficult, and a lot of people don't actually know how to do it. Um, but there you go. Um, that's a training course on its own, perhaps. Strategic mapping. Capture a cause and effect relationship from the bottom up. We make investments. We make a series of investments. Perhaps we do it in facilities, the, the premises, the buildings, the factory, facilities. Maybe we do it in other forms of fixed assets like plant and machinery and equipment, furniture, I don't know, whatever it may be. The question is, if we move that up through learning and goals, are we going to expand our global facility reach? Does that, because we have facilities, does that mean we can now reach further? We can go more into the global market. Can we learn from what we're doing? Can it help us to grow? Our internal processes, what are they? What are they focused on? 
Perhaps they could be focused on an economic model. Well, I would expect them to be so because we're trying to measure the success of our investments in fixed assets. So I would expect that to be an economic model of some kind. And therefore, does that mean that from a stakeholder positioning point of view, there's an improved return on investments? Now, you know, that may well be the shareholders in that stakeholder group. They are a share, they are, after all, a stakeholder. Maybe the staff. The company has made investment into fixed assets. It's made better facilities. Does that mean there's more security for the staff? Maybe they're going to get higher rates of pay. Maybe it's better for the customers because there's a more re better return, because the products are better produced. They're more available globally and internationally. Another one we could look at is the investment into people themselves, human capital. What that might mean, okay? So we invest into better people, more people. Do we learn from that? Do we grow with it? Perhaps that means we need leadership development. Perhaps we need to look at beyond that. We need to connect that into forms of activities that we might use to reduce overall levels of exposure, like ABC. And that in turn leads to improve investments. Maybe the human capital might link into knowledge management and the development and use of knowledge management. And knowledge man management itself can link back into the internal process to reduce and reactivate different activities to improve our return on investment. Maybe that knowledge management could be then used to help us to establish web-based services and self-use services and using the IT infrastructure that we have probably also invested in. There's a complete link with these things. They're all linked together. And that, in turn, gives stakeholder groups more mass, rapid and accessible services, particularly the customers. So the whole thing needs to be completely related. So there is, for everything you do, there's an impact, there's an effect. And each one of those has a relationship impact because everything is related to each other. Nothing is an island. Um, special techniques of building strategic maps. Right? Um, the four to five rule. I think it's self-explanatory. Um, if we look at the example here, we're working through three levels. This is extremely weak. Bottom level, second level, third level up. Most of it's going on here. There's not a spread. It is not a strong development. It's not linking everything vertically and horizontally. It's just a one lump stuck in the middle. What does that mean? It means splitting the perspective. It means a way of putting both drivers and outcomes to match up against each other, to look at core competencies. So where do we look? What are the outcomes that we might be trying to achieve? Well, from a customer point of view, customer growth, retention of customers. How do we retain our customers? How do we keep them satisfied? Different things that might be desirable outcomes. All customers, all businesses want more customers. Growth. But they don't want to lose any existing customers either. Retention. What do they want to make sure? The customers keep being satisfied. The drivers behind that. Delivery timing, pricing, quality, service, reputation. Whichever is applicable. Usually the most important drivers in reality are not price. The most important drivers are other things. Reputation is probably the most important of all. It's reputation that directly impacts on the competitive advantages of businesses. Key benefit of creating strategic maps. Articulates how organizations create value displays the priorities and the relationships between the outcomes, the what, 
and the performance enablers or drivers, the how. What is the relationship between what I'm getting and how I did it? Designs a clear view of how I fit in, i.e. how the sub-organizations work, how the teams work, how the individuals all contribute to organizational success. It cascades the scorecard throughout the whole organization. It clearly maps the various units, the functions, the back-to-back -back organizations. It allows for leverage and ensuring alignment. So benefits of using strategic map systems. Okay, they communicate better. You get executive consensus and accountability. You get education and communication. You get alignment and you promote transparency. You, you'll see I've sourced this from Robert Kaplan at the bottom. That's what he had to say on the subject. Okay. Um, it's, it's reasonably obvious when you start to think about it. So, you know, strategic maps is a better way to communicate strategy. We know there's a problem communicating strategy. We know that. We know that managers do not spend their time communicating their strategy. I introduced you to that in the right beginning. So, different types of scorecard alignment. We get different types of scorecards for different types of requirement. Just an example, that is all this is. So, the interesting point about scorecards is a lot of people see a very generic view of a scorecard and they think that is the balanced scorecard. It's not. We have innumerable scorecards in the business and we have them at all levels of the business. And in fact, the more you move from the strategic level through the tactical level to the operational level, the more and more scorecards you have. Oh, it's just an idea of some of the issues you may be looking at. It's quite generic in nature. So if we extend that into measurements and targets and initiatives, what are we trying to do? Right. Well, for example, the objective, eliminate waste. The measurement, check the number of times you have to rework something. How many times you have to go back and do it again? The target. Two per week, two per month, two per hour, two per day. How am I going to achieve it? What is the initiative? What action do I take? Well, maybe I start to use lean processes in production. Maybe I implement a Six Sigma system for controlling that. I don't know exactly because there's hundreds of ways of doing things. And that will take far too long to go through every single example. We'll be here until midnight in three years' time. But when you actually look at it, you realize what we're talking about. We're talking about aligning the investments through the learning and growth to the internal process through to the stakeholder groups. We're trying to build it together. So I set an objective. I find a way of measuring it. I set a target which I want to achieve. And then I use an initiative to help me to achieve it. Not difficult. Except in practice, it can become quite complicated. So if we then align that even further, what is a goal? Okay, a goal. Achieve business and operational efficiencies with best practices in the private sector, for example. Reduce operational service costs by 50% in the next five years. It is an objective. How would I measure that? The cost per outlet office, the cost per regional office. I would set a series of targets. 5% improvement in year one, 10% improvement in year two, 15% improvement in year three. What initiative might I do to help me to meet this objective of reducing operational costs? I might use activity-based costings, for example. I might use management systems different ways of doing it. Another objective to help me to achieve business operational efficiencies is reduce, identify reactivities within primary processes, for example. So that is to say, don't keep redoing things. 
So I've done it once, I don't do it again. I only do it once. So if I can reduce that by 80% over the next three years, I'm going to help myself to gain efficiencies and best practice. So it's a good objective to have. So what is the measurement? I measure waste. I measure recycling. I look at time to end periods and all sorts of things. I look at different regions, etc. And then what target do I set? Waste stream reductions. I have less waste of by 5% each year for the next three years. Right? What systems of it might I do? What initiatives might I use to get there? Lean management, for example, Six Sigma, whatever seems the right initiative in that particular case. Well, what am I doing? I've got a goal. I've got a series of objectives to help me meet that goal. In this case, one goal, two objectives, measurement for each of the objective, maybe more than one method. I've got targets and I've got initiatives. So we're moving just beyond this kind of strange floating idea of KPIs. And we're breaking this into much more detailed performance management systems. I'm not saying KPIs are not important, they are, but not on their own. They cannot just exist. <clears throat> so performance measurement is a process by which a business, a program, a function, an outlet, an outlet <coughs> objectively, objectively, through object, objectives, that means, assesses and evaluates the extent by which it is accomplishing a specific objective goal or even mission level. Performance measurement on its own is incomplete. That is why a KPI on its own is incomplete. We need performance management processes. That means we need to link all of the business investments, all of the processes, all of the strategy, all together. And that's one of the biggest problems we find. A lot of people are quite good, and I said this in the beginning, of coming up with various performance measurements. But they fail to manage that performance because they fail to link everything together. And most people, I already said, who work in companies have no idea how what they do links to the organizational strategy. They don't understand it. They don't know what it means to them. And that means it goes wrong. So why should we bother? Why should we measure performance? Why is it important? Well, inevitably, it helps you make good decisions. If you know how you performed, you can make a good decision next time. You can manage by results rather than by dreams. You can make people accountable for their actions. It helps you distinguish between a program success or a failure because you have something to measure against. Allow for organizational learning and improvement. It justifies requests for new budgets or additional budgets or just continuation of budgets. It helps you optimize investment because you know what you're going to get from it. It provides a mean of performance criteria. It helps you fulfill a series of mandates that may be laid down by the shareholders, for example, by a government department. It helps you make change. In fact, there's a hundred reasons why you should measure performance. Everybody measures performance. If you want to be the finest athlete in the world, if you want to be the greatest football player in the world, Someone is going to stand there and measure your performance. Then they are going to benchmark your performance against other great athletes or other great football players to help you to improve. And then they are going to work out that if I invest this much money in you, this much time in you, is that going to make you better or is it going to make you worse? Or is it going to make no difference at all? Is it worth making that investment? And so it is in business. Without measurement, decision makers 
have absolutely no basis at all for knowing what is going on in their enterprise. They don't know what's happening. The problem is that historically decision makers only tended to measure financial margins and nothing else. And that in itself is not a complete picture. Effectively making and supporting decisions regarding investments, plans, policies, schedules, structures. Specifically communicating specific performance expectations. Identifying gaps that should be analyzed. Providing feedback, identifying performance, etc. They can't do any of these things, any of these desirable things that any MBA course will tell any manager they should be doing if they don't measure. You can look at different types of measurements. I mean, take a fast food restaurant as an example and leading in measurement type, the definition. Intermediate outcomes that predict drive bottom line performance results, like, for example, employee turnover rate. Employee turnover rate is a very big problem in fast food restaurants. Ask McDonald's. Lagging. The bottom line performance against the results of the action taken. You can check that by employee satisfaction. Input. The amount of investment, assets, equipment, etc. that you need. The labor hours, the dollars you spent. The example might be the number of cashiers, desks you have. Output, the unit's production, the service rendered. So, for example, how might you look at that? The number of value meals ordered. Outcome, the resultant effect. Check the satisfaction, customer satisfaction weighting. Objective quantitative measurement, numerical indicators of performance. For example, how long does a customer have to wait for their meal? Subjective quality measures, perceptions evaluating a major customer stakeholder. How many complaints do you get? How many complaints come through as a percentage of the total amount of customers served? And so on. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of possibilities. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. So, measurements through the different perspectives. The customer perspective, the internal processes, the investment, the learning and growth. This is the balance scorecard. This is what we look at. All I've done is a lot of versions of the balance scorecard. Instead of saying investments, we'll say financial. We'll just call it the investment perspective because that's what it means. And these are the measurements we might be looking for. <coughs> Excuse me, but might be because there's hundreds of them. Right. Um, remember, this shouldn't be vague. I already mentioned that. I think that's kind of me repeating myself. Selection criteria performance measurements. Are they meaningful? Are they valuable? Are they balanced? Are they linked? Are they credible? Etc. All things that need to be gone through in detail. It's quite a complex process, this, actually. Uh, the three criteria that we use in the scorecard. They must be relevant. They must be measurable. And they must be actionable. Relevant. Do they address the problem? Do they give us any results? Is the information that we get going to help us? Measurable. Do they help us facilitate analysis? Is the data available to us? Can we actually even collect data once we've got it? Is it actionable? Is there any use for what we're doing? And when you've done that, now you can start to look at some of the tools you might use inputs through processes to outputs to intermediate outputs to the end analysis casual analysis models like for example Ishikawa's fishbone analysis model using the five M's four P's model process flow models there's 101 of them there are so many different tools that we can use to help us determine what to measure and obviously this is only a webinar we don't have time to go into the details of each one of these um, but there are many how do you set the targets? You look at past historical data and see what happened in the past. You look at performance levels in similar organizations. Benchmark yourself against other businesses. Best practice. What is best practice in the agency, the public sector, the private sector? Any newly launched services that you may not have remembered or thought about? Any prototyping you should do? Any major strategic shifts in the market that you haven't considered? or brought in to awareness. 
major strategic shift in the market. Um, that would be an interesting one. There's hundreds of examples of that. Um, it's not that long ago when everybody thought fax machines were the greatest thing ever. It's not that long ago when everybody realized they weren't and they disappeared. Um, that was a major strategic shift in the market. We've had so many. It just goes on and on and on. Um, checklists for setting targets. Okay, what kind of checklists do I need to create? I'm gonna go through. The, I mean, these are these are just examples of the kind of checklists you might use. There are so many that you can come up with, but you do need to come up with them. You need to think through them. What kind of initiatives should you have? What sits behind them? Are they leader sponsored? Are the board sponsoring them? The board saying yes. Let's let's move this forward. What what type of investment might be required? People, funding, money, technology. What might be needed? Um, has somebody got ownership over this initiative? Has someone taken ownership, i.e. accountability? It must have deliverables in place. It must have a series of milestones that must be met. Therefore, it needs timed deadlines. They may be difficult to actually even do. The problem with initiatives is they are extremely difficult if someone doesn't resource them properly. Resource means physical resource, human resource, the resource of time, and of course the financial resource. You'll get nothing unless you allow resources. You need to encounter obstacles. You always will. When you're looking at initiatives, things will get in the way. People will become confused. Different functions will start to go into conflicts and start saying, I don't want that. That's got nothing for me. It's not valuable. Or it is valuable and I do want it. It's not fair. And so on and so on and so on. Initiatives should help you to be strategic. Series of initiatives there, strategic goals or objectives, whichever way you want to look at those ones. Um, just ideas on how the initiative should help you to get your executions of your strategy. Um, all right, so for example, initiative, have a uh, web portal. Uh, why do I have a web portal? What does it do for me? Helps me reduce costs, helps me to streamline services, typically done in the retail industry, etc. So I, I'm just keeping an eye on the time as we talk. Um, I kind of think I'll go past that one, actually. Um, lots of different strategic themes I've mentioned. I've been talking about innovation, lean, adaptive processing, stakeholder reach, all these things I've mentioned. You need to investigate these in your strategic mapping processes and truly understand strategy and how strategy impacts and how strategy helps you. If you don't, you can't do a balanced scorecard. Um, and then, finally... Um, the Malcolm, um, sorry, Malcolm Babbage, that's a mistake there. Anyway, um, that's a mistake, it's a typo. Um, it's not Aldridge, it's Babbage. Aldridge should be a B there. Um, Vernon Savannah Scorecard. He, he said that we need leadership. Leadership relates to learning and growth. He said we need human capital. That relates to learning and growth. Um, the business results relate to measurements and targets. The process mapping relates to the internal process perspective. Strategic mapping relates to strategic plan sorry, strategic planning relates to strategic mapping. And customer focus relates to stakeholder perspectives. Strategic planning, PCA, position choice action, is a key area of strategic management. The three key elements of designing strategies under rationale models. Um, that is what leads you to have a strategic map. Okay, um, I think you're probably going to realize beyond that that there's a lot of stuff in here, an enormous amount of stuff. So this was an introduction to the balance scorecard. The last thing I wanted to show you was just that lovely graphical representation that appears in every single book you read. 
because frankly it doesn't tell me anything. I wanted to try and explain the whole process. The balance scorecard is by far the best way to measure performance in organizations. By far. As long as you know how to do it. This, of course, only 40 minutes, just over 45, whatever now, cannot actually tell you that, but it can introduce you to it. It can give you an idea. I hope I've given you some, um, okay, I hope I've given you some information that will help you. I have a question here from Amro. How to differentiate goals from objectives? Yes, it's a simple one, Amro. Um, a goal is a macro view, it's the big picture. My goal is to win the World Cup. My objective is to win the match. So in order to win the World Cup, I have to win many matches, not just one. So the macro view is win the World Cup. The objective is to therefore win the first match, the second match, the third match, the fourth match, and so on. A series of objectives. So big macro view right, Let, broken down into a series of objectives. Uh, my goal very soon is to go and get myself a nice cup of coffee. In order to do that, my first objective will be to say goodbye to you. My next objective will be to go out of the room. My next objective will be go to the kitchen and make the coffee, and then I can sit down and meet my goal of a nice cup of coffee, etc., etc., etc. I hope that distinguishes between goals and objectives. The smart measurement tool that people talk about for writing accurate objectives in itself is just a general one. Um, and we'll ask how to create appropriate strategic themes in relation to the perspective of the strategic map. The only reason I am laughing um, is that requires a course in strategy. Um, my simple answer to that is through understanding the process of generic strategies. Um, look at Michael Porter's generic strategies um, and decide which is more important. So, for example, am I going to use a cost leadership theme or am I going to use a differentiation theme in my strategy? Um, is that's going to be market-wide or is it going to focus on individual markets? Am I going to use some form of um, blended strategy to achieve the market? So, for example, uh, Apple. Apple as a business have survived and developed into the world's largest company by working with a differentiated strategy. Um, that is to say that their key interest has always been to differentiate themselves by quality, by desirability, by the, the I don't know, the, 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 the brand allurements, anything which takes them away from being compared on price. So they're not a cost leadership company. On one occasion, on one occasion only, they decide to focus on a given market, which was China. They went into the given market and they did it by becoming cost leadership. That is to say, what they tried to do was create Apple at a price that they believed the Chinese would buy. And they did that, of course, with the 5C. Nobody bought it. It didn't win. It, in fact, failed dramatically on them. Um, so much so that instead of knocking Samsung out the market, they knocked themselves out the market. Um, which was a little bit ridiculous. So they got it wrong. So my answer to your question, if you're going to create a strategic map, you really ought to understand strategic management and understand it properly. Um, one way of doing that is to understand how to select or make the right strategic choices. One method of doing that is by using generic strategic planning as explained by Porter. Um, sorry, I can't go more than that. It is just such a big subject. Um, if you want to know, get yourself a course on strategy and talk to me about that. Uh, Said, how long does it take to understand the best use of BSC? Uh, how would that apply to a public sector? Ah, 
Wow. Um, how long does it? <laughs> how long? How long is it to understand the best use of BSC? How long is a piece of string? Um, I think the answer and the only real answer I need uh, to answer that, um, so it would be to say to you, um, I can't, <laughs> to be frank. Um, you need to look at it in relationship to each strategy. You need to have a lot more deeper understanding of strategy before you can start to think about performance management of that strategy. I'm sorry, I'm really, I'm sorry, but it's really difficult to add that. Um, right, how would we apply uh, public sectors such as economic and labor planning, AMRO? Um, gosh. It doesn't really work for, for labor planning. It is not designed for labor planning. It is designed for measurement of performance as opposed to planning labor. And it's not what it's for. Uh, do I need a dashboard software for BSC? No, not at all. Um, that came from Saud. Um, no, you don't need a software, a dashboard software system for it. It, it. It's not essential. I mean, yes, it can help, but it depends on what you buy. I don't, I don't think that helps anymore. I think we're there. I don't think there's any more. Right, if, if anybody wants more detailed feedback, because obviously time is a major problem, this, and it is a, it is a very big subject. Um, please feel free to email in. It will get passed to me, and I'll do my best to answer. Hmm. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, yes, and of course, let us know if you want balanced scorecard courses um, or any other strategic courses, and we're here. Sorry, that's a bit of marketing, but it's, it's a relevant point. Sorry, it's not meant to be anymore. All right, guys, um, I've done my best in a, in a short period of time. You know it's a big subject, so, you know, um, but it is very worth going into this in detail. Thank you, and good afternoon.